because you're literally deleting the existence of that whole input, which is almost certainly not what you want. But for an embedding, an embedding is just effectively a matrix multiply by a one-hot encoded matrix. So it's just another layer. So it makes perfect sense to have dropout on the output of the embedding because you're putting dropout on those activations of that layer. And so you're basically saying, let's delete at random some of the results of that um, embedding, some of those activations. So that makes sense. The other reason we do it that way is because I did very extensive experiments about a year ago where on this data set I tried lots of different ways of doing kind of everything. Um, and you can actually see it here. I put it all in a spreadsheet, of course, Microsoft Excel, put them into a pivot table to summarize them all together um, to find out kind of which different choices and hyperparameters and architectures worked well and worked less well. And then I created um, all these little graphs. And these are like little summary training graphs for different combinations of hyperparameters and architectures. And I found that there was one of them which ended up consistently getting a uh, good predictive accuracy. The kind of bumpiness of the training uh, was pretty low. And you can see on, it was just a nice smooth curve. And so like this is an example of the kind of experiments that I do that end up in the fast AI library, right? So embedding, embedding dropout was one of those things that I just found worked really well. And basically these, the results of these experiments is why it looks like this rather than something else. Well, it's a combination of these experiments, but then why did I do these particular experiments? Well, because it was very influenced by um, what worked well in the, that Kaggle prize winners um, paper. Um, but there were quite a few parts of that paper I thought there were some other choices they could have made. I wonder why they didn't. And I tried them out and found out what actually works and what doesn't work as well and found a few um, little improvements. So that's the kind of experiments that you can play around with as well um, when you try different models and architectures, different dropouts, layer numbers, uh, number of activations, and so forth. So um, having created our learner, we can type learn.model to take a look at it. Um, and as you would expect, in that there is a whole bunch of embeddings. Each of those embedding matrices ha tells you, well, this is the number of levels of the input for each input. Right? And you can match these with, the, um, with your list cat bars. Right? So the first one will be store. So that's not surprising. There are 1,116 stores. And then the second number, of course, is the size of the embedding. And that's a number that you get to choose. And so FastAI has some defaults, which uh, actually work really, really well nearly all the time. So I almost never change them. But when you create your tabular learner, um, you can absolutely pass in um, an embedding size dictionary, which uh, maps uh, variable names to embedding sizes for anything where you want to override the defaults. And then we've got our embedding dropout layer. And then we've got a batch norm layer with 16 inputs. Okay, the 16 inputs make sense because we have 16 continuous variables. The length of cont names is 16. So this is something for our continuous variables. And specifically, it's over here, bn cont on our continuous variables. And bn cont is a batch norm 1D. What's that? Well, the first short answer is it's one of the things that I experimented with um, as to uh, having batch norm or not in this, and I found that it worked really well. Um, and then specifically what it is, is <clears throat> extremely unclear. Let me describe it to you. It's kind of a bit of regularization. It's kind of a bit of training helper. Um, it's called batch normalization. And it comes from this paper. Actually, before I do this, I just want to mention one other really funny thing. Um, dropout, I mentioned it was a master's thesis. Not only was it a master's thesis, one of the most influential papers of the last 10 years, it was rejected from the main uh, neural nets conference, uh, what was then called NIPS, now called NEURIPS. Um, I think this is just, it's very interesting um, because it's just a reminder that, you know, A, our academic community 
is generally extremely poor at recognizing which things are going to turn out to be important. Um, uh, generally, people are looking for stuff that are in the field that they're working on and understand. So Dropout kind of came out of left field. It's kind of hard to understand what's going on. Um, and so that's kind of interesting. And so, you know, it's a reminder that if you just follow, you know, as you kind of develop it beyond being just a practitioner into actually doing your own research, uh, don't just focus on the stuff everybody's talking about. Focus on the stuff you think might be interesting. Because the stuff everybody's talking about generally turns out not to be very interesting. Uh, the community is very poor at recognizing uh, high impact um, papers uh, when they come out. Um, Batch normalization, on the other hand, was immediately recognized as high impact. I definitely remember everybody talking about it in 2015 when it came out. And that was because it was so obvious. They showed this picture showing um, the current then state-of-the-art uh, ImageNet model inception. Um, this is how long it took them to get uh, you know, a pretty good result. Um, and then they tried the same thing with this new thing called batch norm, and they just did it way, way, way quickly. And so that was enough for pretty much everybody to go, wow, this is interesting. And specifically, they said this thing's called batch normalization, and it's accelerating training by reducing internal covariate shift. So what is internal covariate shift? Well, it doesn't matter, because this is one of those things where researchers came up with some intuition and some idea about this thing they wanted to try, they did it, it worked well, they then post hoc added on some mathematical analysis to try and claim why it worked, and it turned out they were totally wrong. In the last two months, there's been two papers, so it took three years for people to really figure this out, in the last two months there's been two papers that have shown batch normalization doesn't reduce covariate shift at all. And even if it did, that has nothing to do with why it works. So, um, so I think that's a kind of an interesting insight, again, you know, which is like why we should be focusing on being practitioners and experimentalists and developing an intuition. Right? Um, what batch norm does is what you see in this picture here, in this paper. Um, here are um, steps or batches, right? and here is loss. And here, the red line is what happens when you train without batch norm. Very, very bumpy. And here, the blue line is what happens when you train with batch norm. Not very bumpy at all. What that means is you can increase your learning rate with batch norm because these big bumps represent times that you're really at risk of your set of weights jumping off into some awful part of the weight space that it can never get out of again. So if it's less bumpy, then you can train at a higher learning rate. So that's actually what's going on. And here's what it is. This is the algorithm. And it's really simple. The algorithm is going to take a mini batch. Right? So we have a mini batch. And remember, this is a layer. So the thing coming into it is activations. OK? So it's a layer, and it's going to take in some activations. And so the activations, it's calling x1, x2, x3, and so forth. The first thing we do is we find the mean of those activations. Sum divided by the count, that's just the mean. And the second thing we do is we find the variance of those activations. Uh, difference squared divided by the mean is the variance. And then we normalize. So the, the values minus the mean divided by the standard deviation um, is the normalized ver ver version. OK, it turns out that bit's actually not that important. We used to think it was. OK, but it turns out it's not. The really important bit is the next bit. We take those values and we add a vector of biases. They call it beta here. And we've seen that before. We've used a bias term before. Okay, so we're just going to add a bias term as per usual. And then we're going to use another thing that's a lot like a bias term, but rather than adding it, we're going to multiply by it. So there's these parameters gamma and beta, which are learnable parameters. Remember in a neural net, there's only two kinds of number, activations and parameters. These are parameters. Okay, they're things that are learnt with gradient descent. This is just a normal bias layer, beta. And this is a multiplicative bias layer. Nobody calls it that, but that's all it is, right? It's just like bias, but we multiply rather than add. That's all batch norm is. Right? That's what the layer does. So why is that able to achieve this fantastic result? Um, I'm not sure anybody has exactly written this down before. 
Um, if they have, uh, I apologize for failing to cite it because I haven't seen it. Um, but let me explain what's actually going on here. Um, the value of our predictions y hat is some function of our various weights. There could be millions of them, weight 1 million. And it's also a function, of course, of the inputs to our layer. This function here is our neural net function, whatever is going on in our neural net. And then our loss, let's say it's mean squared error, is just our actuals minus our predicted squared. OK? So let's say we're trying to predict movie review outcomes, and they're between 1 and 5. Okay, And we've been trying to train our model, and the activations at the very end are currently between minus 1 and 1. So they're way off where they need to be. The scale is off, the mean is off. So what can we do? One thing we could do would be to try and come up with a new set of weights that cause the spread to increase and cause the mean to increase as well. But that's going to be really hard to do because remember, all these weights interact in very intricate ways, right? We've got all those nonlinearities and they all combine together. So to kind of just move up is going to require navigating through this complex landscape and we, you know, we use all these tricks like momentum and atom and stuff like that to help us, but it still requires a lot of twiddling around to get there. So that's going to take a long time, and it's going to be bumpy. But what if we did this? What if we went times g plus b? We added two more parameter vectors. Well, now it's really easy, right? In order to increase the scale, that number has a direct gradient to increase the scale. To change the mean, that number has a direct gradient to change the mean. There's no interactions or complexities, it's just straight up and down, straight in and out. And that's what batch norm does, right? So batch norm is basically making it easier for it to do this really important thing, which is to shift the outputs up and down and in and out. And that's why we end up with these results. So those details in some ways don't matter terribly. The really important thing to know is you definitely want to use it, right? Or if not it, something like it. There's various other types of normalization around nowadays, um, but batch norm um, works great. The other main normalization type we use in fast AI is something called weight norm, uh, which is a much more just in the last few months uh, development. Um, okay, so that's batch norm. Uh, and so what we do is we create a batch norm layer for every continuous variable. n cont is the number of continuous variables. In fast AI, n underscore something always means the count of that thing. Cont always means continuous. So then here is where we use it. We grab our continuous variables and we throw them through a batch norm layer. And so then over here, you can see it in our model. <coughs> um, one interesting thing is this momentum here. This is not momentum like in optimization, but this is momentum as in exponentially weighted moving average. Um, specifically, this mean and standard deviation, we don't actually use a different mean and standard deviation for every mini batch. If we did, it would vary so much that it'd be very hard to train. So instead, we take an exponentially weighted moving average of the mean and standard deviation. Okay? And if you don't remember what I mean by that, Look back at last week's lesson uh, to remind yourself about exponentially weighted moving averages, um, which we implemented in Excel um, for uh, the momentum and uh, atom gradient squared terms. Um, you can vary the amount of momentum in a batch norm layer by passing a different value to the constructor in PyTorch. Um, if you use a smaller number, it means that the mean and standard deviation will vary less from mini batch to mini batch, and that will have less of a regularization effect. A larger number will mean the variation will be greater from mini batch to mini batch. That will have more of a regularization effect. So as well as this thing of training more nicely because it's parameterized better, 
this um, momentum term in the um, main and standard deviation is the thing that adds this uh, nice regularization piece. When you add batch norm, you should also be able to use a higher learning rate. So that's our model. Uh, so then you can go LR find, you can have a look, and then you can go fit, you can save it, you can plot the losses, you can fit a bit more, um, and we end up at 0.103, tenth place in the competition was 0.108, so it's looking good, all right? Um, uh, again, take it with a slight grain of salt, um, because what you actually need to do is use the real training set and submit it to Kaggle, um, but you can see we're very much, you know, amongst the kind of cutting edge of, of models, at least as of 2015. And as I say, there haven't really been any architectural improvements since then. There wasn't batch norm when this was around, so the fact we added batch norm means that we should get better results, and certainly more quickly. And if I remember correctly, in their model, they had to train at a slow, lower learning rate for quite a lot longer. Um, as you can see, this is uh, about less than 45 minutes of training. So that's nice and fast. Any questions? In what proportion would you use dropout versus other regularization errors like weight decay, L2 norms, et cetera? So remember that L2 regularization and weight decay are kind of two ways of doing the same thing. Um, and we should always use the weight decay version, not the L2 regularization version. Um, so there's weight decay. There's batch norm, which kind of has a regularizing effect. Um, there's data augmentation, which we'll see soon. And there's dropout. Um, so batch norm we pretty much always want. So that's easy. Um, data augmentation we'll see in a moment. Uh, so then it's really between dropout versus weight decay. Um, I have no idea. Uh, I, don't, I don't think I've seen anybody provide a compelling study of how to combine those two things. Can you always use one instead of the other? Why, why not? I don't think anybody has figured that out. Um, I think in practice, it seems that you generally want a bit of both. Uh, you pretty much always want some weight decay, um, but you often also want a bit of dropout. But Honestly, I don't know why. I, and I've not seen anybody really explain why or how to decide. So this is one of these things you have to try out and uh, kind of get a feel for what tends to work for your kinds of problems. Um, I think the defaults that we provide in most of our learners should work pretty well in most situations. Um, but yeah, definitely play around with it. OK, the um, next kind of regularization we're going to look at is data augmentation. And data augmentation is one of the least well-studied types of regularization, but it's the kind that I think I'm kind of the most excited about. The reason I'm kind of the most excited about it is that you basically, there's basically almost no cost to it. Um, you can do data augmentation and get better generalization without it taking longer to train, um, without underfitting, um, to an extent, at least. So let me explain. Um, so what we're going to do now is we're going to come back to computer vision, and we're going to come back to our pets data set again. So let's, let's load it in. Right, our pets data set, the images were inside the images subfolder. And I'm going to call get transforms as per usual. Um, but when we call get transforms, there's a whole long list of things that we can provide. And so far, we haven't been varying that much at all. But in order to really understand data augmentation, I'm going to kind of ratchet up all of the defaults. So <clears throat> there's a parameter here for what's the probability of an affine transform happening. What's the probability of a light, lighting transform happening? So I set them both to one. So they're all going to get transformed. They're going to do more rotation, more zoom, more lighting transforms, and more warping. What do all those mean? Well, you should check the documentation. And you do that by typing doc. And there's a doc, the brief documentation. But the real documentation is in docs. So I'll click on show in docs. And here it is. Right? And so this tells you 
what all of those do. But generally, the most interesting parts of the docs tend to be at the top, where you kind of get the summaries of what's going on. And so here there's something called list of transforms. And here, you can see every transform has a, something showing you lots of different values of it, right? So here's brightness. So make sure you read these. And remember, these notebooks, you can open up and run this code yourself and get this output. All of these, no, all of these HTML documentation documents are auto-generated from the notebooks in the docs underscore source directory in the fastai repo, right? So you will see the exact same cats if you try this. Silva really likes cats, so there's a lot of cats in the documentation. Um, and I think, you know, because he's been so awesome at creating great documentation, he gets to pick the cats, so. Um, so, for example, looking at different values of brightness, what I do here is I look to see two things. The first is, for which of these levels of tra uh, uh, transformation is it still clear what the picture is a picture of? So this is kind of getting to a point where it's pretty unclear. This is possibly getting a little unclear. The second thing I do is I look at the actual data set that I'm modeling, or particularly the data set that I'll be using as validation set, and I try to get a sense of what the variation in this case in lighting is. So if they're like nearly all professionally taking photos, I would probably want them all to be about in the middle. But if the if the kind of their uh, photos that are taken by some pretty amateur photographers, there are likely to be some that are very overexposed, some very underexposed, right? So you should pick a value of this data augmentation for brightness that both allows the image to still be seen clearly and also represents the kind of data that you're going to be using this to model on in practice. So you've got to say the same thing for contrast, right? It would be unusual to have a data set with such ridiculous contrast, but perhaps you do, in which case you should use data augmentation up to that level. But if you don't, then you shouldn't. Um, this one called dihedral is just one that does um, every possible rotation and flip. And so obviously most of your pictures are not going to be upside down cats. Right? So you probably would say, hey, this doesn't make sense. I won't use this for this data set. But if you're looking at satellite images, of course you would. On the other hand, flip makes perfect sense, so you would include that. Um, a lot of um, things that you can do with FastAI lets you pick a padding mode, and this is what padding mode looks like. You can pick zeros, you can pick border, which just replicates, or you can pick reflection, which as you can see is it's as if the last little few pixels are in a mirror. Reflection's nearly always better, by the way. Um, I don't know that anybody else has really studied this, but we've, we, we have studied it in some depth. Um, haven't actually written a paper about it, but just enough for our own purposes to say reflection works best most of the time. So that's the default. Um, then there's a really cool bunch of perspective warping ones, um, which I'll probably show you by using symmetric warp. Um, if you look at the kind of the, we've added black borders to this, so it's more obvious for what's going on. And as you can see, what symmetric warp is doing, it's as if the camera is being moved above or to the side of the object and literally warping the whole thing like that, right? <clears throat> and so the cool thing is that as you can see, each of these pictures, it's as if this cat was being taken kind of from different angles, right? So they're all kind of optically sensible, right? And so this is a really great type of data augmentation. It's also one which I don't know of any other library that does it, or at least certainly one that does it in a way that's both fast and keeps the image crisp, uh, as it is in FastAI. So this is like, if you're looking to win a Kaggle competition, this is the kind of thing that's gonna like get you above the people that aren't using the FastAI library. So having looked at all that, um, we are going to um, add this, uh, have a little get data function that just does the usual get, uh, data block stuff, but we're going to add padding mode uh, explicitly so that we can turn on padding mode of zeros, just so we can see what's going on better. Um, FastAI has this handy little function called plot multi, which is going to create a three by three grid of plots, and each one will contain the result of calling this 
function, which will receive the plot coordinates and the axis. And so I'm actually going to plot the exact same thing in every box, but because this is a training data set, it's going to use data augmentation. And so you can see the same doggy using lots of different kinds of data augmentation. And so you can see why this is going to work really well, because these pictures all look pretty different. Right? But we didn't have to do any extra hand labeling or anything. They're like, it's like free extra data. Okay? So data augmentation is really, really great. And one of the big opportunities for research is to figure out ways to do data augmentation in other domains. So how can you do data augmentation with text data, or genomic data, or histopathology data, or whatever, right? Um, almost nobody's looking at that, and to me it's one of the biggest opportunities that could let you decrease data requirements by like 5 to 10x. So here's the same thing again, but with um, reflection padding instead of uh, zero padding, and you can kind of see, like see this doggy's legs are actually being reflected at the bottom here. Um, so reflection padding tends to create images that are kind of m much more naturally reasonable, like in the real world you don't get black borders like this, so they do seem to work better. Okay, so because we're going to study um, convolutional neural networks, we are going to create a convolutional neural network. Um, you know how to create them, so I'll go ahead and create one. I will fit it for a little bit, I will unfreeze it, I will then create a larger version of the data set, 352 by 352, and fit for a little bit more. And I will save it. Okay, so we have a CNN, and we're going to try and figure out what's going on in our CNN. And the way we're going to try and figure it out is, is specifically that we're going to try to learn how to create this picture. This is a heat map, right? This is a picture which shows me what part of the image did the CNN focus on when it was trying to decide what this picture is? So we're going to make this heat map from scratch. Okay. When we, so we're kind of at a point now in the course where I'm assuming that if you've got to this point, you know, and you're still here, thank you, then you're interested enough that you're prepared to kind of dig into some of these details. So we're actually going to learn how to create this heat map without almost any fast AI stuff. We're going to use pure kind of tensor arithmetic in PyTorch, and we're going to try and use that to really understand what's going on. So to warn you, um, none of it's rocket science, but a lot of it's going to look really new. So don't expect to get it the first time, but expect to like listen jump into the notebook, try a few things, test things out, look particularly at like tensor shapes and inputs and outputs to check your understanding, then go back and listen again. Right? And kind of try it a few times because um, you will get there, right? It's just that there's going to be a lot of new concepts because we haven't done that much stuff in pure PyTorch. Okay, so um, what we're going to do is we're going to have a seven minute break and then we're going to come back and we're going to learn all about the innards of a CNN. So I'll see you at 7.50. So let's learn about um, convolutional neural networks. Um, you know, the funny thing is, um, it's pretty unusual to get close to the end of a course and only then look at convolutions. Um, but like when you think about it, knowing actually how batch norm works, or how dropout works, or how convolutions work, isn't nearly as important as knowing how it all goes together, and what to do with them, and how to figure out how to do those things better. Um, um, but it's, you know, we're kind of at a point now where we want to be able to do things like that. Um, and although, you know, we're, we're adding this functionality directly into the library, so you can kind of run a function to do that, you know, the more you do, the more you'll find things that you want to do a little bit differently to how we do them. 
or there'll be something in your domain where you think like, oh, I could do a slight variation of that. So you're kind of getting to a point in your experience now where it helps to know how to do more stuff yourself, and that means you need to understand what's really going on behind the scenes. Um, so what's really going on behind the scenes is that we are creating a neural network that looks a lot like this, right? But rather than doing a matrix multiply here and here and here, we're actually going to do instead a convolution. And a convolution is just a kind of matrix multiply which has some interesting properties. You should definitely check out this website, satosa.io slash ev, explained visually, where we have stolen this beautiful um, animation. It's actually a JavaScript thing that you can actually play around with yourself um, uh, in order to show you how convolutions work. And it's actually showing you a convolution as we move around these little red squares. So here's, here's a picture, a black and white or a grayscale picture. Right? And so each three by three bit of this picture, as this red thing moves around, it shows you a different three by three part. Right? It shows you over here the values of the pixels. Right? So um, in FastAI's case, our pixel values are between 0 and 1. In this case, they're between 0 and 255. Right? So here are nine pixel values. This area is pretty white, so they're pretty high numbers. Okay? And so as we move around, you can see the nine big numbers change, and you can also see their colors change. Up here, there's another nine numbers. And you can see those in the little x1, x2, x1. Here we are, one, two, one. And what you might see going on is as we move this little red block, as these numbers change, we then multiply them by the corresponding numbers up here. And so let's start using some nomenclature. The thing up here we are going to call the kernel, the convolutional kernel. So we're going to take each little three by three part of this image, and we're going to do an element-wise multiplication of each of the nine pixels that we are mousing over with each of the nine items in our kernel. And so once we multiply each set together, we can then add them all up. And that is what's shown on the right. As the little bunch of red things move over there, you can see there's one red thing that appears over here. The reason there's one red thing over here is because each set of nine, after getting through the element-wise multiplication of the kernel, get added together to create one output. So therefore, the size of this image has one pixel less on each edge than the original, as you can see. See how there's black borders on it? That's because at the edge, the three by three kernel can't quite go any further, right? So the furthest you can go is to end up with a dot in the middle, just off the corner, right? So why are we doing this? Well, perhaps you can see what's happened. This face has turned into some white parts outlining the horizontal edges. How? Well, the how is just by doing this element mice multiplication of each set of nine pixels with this kernel, adding them together, and sticking the result in the corresponding spot over here. Why is that creating white spots where the horizontal edges are? Well, let's think about it. Let's look up here. So if we're just in this little bit here, right, then the spots above it are all pretty white, so they have high numbers. So the bits above it, are big numbers, are getting multiplied by one, two, one. So that's going to create a big number. And the ones in the middle are all zeros, so I don't care about that. And then the ones underneath are all small numbers, because they're all close to zero, so that really doesn't do much at all. So therefore, that little set there is going to end up with bright white. Okay? Whereas on the other side, right, down here, you've got light pixels underneath, so they're going to get a lot of negative. Dark pixels on top, which are very small, so not much happens, 
So therefore, over here, we're going to end up with very negative. So this thing where we take each 3 by 3 area and element-wise multiply them with a kernel and add each of those up together to create one output is called a convolution. That's it. That's a convolution. So that might look familiar to you, right? Because what we did back a while ago is we looked at that Zeiler and Fergus paper where we saw like each different layer and we visualized what the weights were doing. And do you remember how the first layer was basically like finding diagonal edges and gradients? That's because that's all a convolution can do. Right? Each of our layers is just a convolution. So the first layer can do nothing more than this kind of thing. But the nice thing is the next layer could then take the results of this, right, and it could kind of combine one channel. So one, the output of one convolutional field is called a channel. Right? So it could take one channel that found top edges and another channel that finds left edges, and then the layer above that could take those two as input and create something that finds top left corners, as we saw when we looked at those Zeiler and Fergus visualizations. So let's take a look at this from another angle, or quite a few other angles, um, and we're going to look at a fantastic uh, post from a guy called Matt Kleinsmith, who was actually a student in um, the first year that we did this course, and uh, he wrote this um, as uh, part of his project work um, back then. Um, and uh, what he's going to show here is, here is our image. It's a 3x3 three three image. And our kernel is a 2x2 two two kernel. And what we're going to do is we're going to apply this kernel to the top left 2x2 two two part of this image. And so the pink bit will be correspondingly multiplied by the pink bit, the green by the green, and so forth. And they all get added up together to create this top left in the output. So in other words, P equals alpha times A, beta times B, gamma times D, delta times E. There it is. Plus B, which is a bias. Okay, so that's fine. That's just a normal bias. So you can see how basically each of these output pixels is the result of some different linear equation. That makes sense? And you can see these same four weights are being moved around because this is our convolutional kernel. Here's another way of looking at it from Matt, which is, here is a classic neural network view. And so P now is a result of multiplying every one of these inputs by a weight and then adding them all together, except the gray ones are going to have a value of zero, right? Because remember P was only connected to A, B, D, and E. A, B, D, and E. So in other words, remembering that this represents a matrix multiplication, therefore we can represent this as a matrix multiplication. So here is our list of pixels in our 3x3 image.